You might know him as Mayor Mark, a former CCM president. But a quick glance at his Twitter handle these days and you'll see he is ex-Mayor Mark. But he hasn't strayed far from public service, taking a job as Commissioner of the Department of Revenue Services. Bouton still plays a crucial role in local and state government. He joins the Municipal Voice today to talk about his role and, crucially, what municipalities stand to gain from the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. We'd like to thank our sponsors at Gateway and Housatonic Community Colleges. The Municipal Voice is the Connecticut Commerce of Municipalities podcast in collaboration with WNHH LP 103.5 FM. I'm your host, Matt Ford. As always, be sure to give us a like and let us know what you're thinking in the comments. CCM's Municipal Voice podcast continues to present a key forum on important state local issues. The views expressed do not necessarily reflect the consensus views of CCM or member municipal leaders. Commissioner Patton, thanks for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me. It's great to be here. It's been almost two years now since you've taken on the commissioner position uh, with the state. And, you know, in the past, you've also been a state representative. But to a lot of us at CCM, certainly, and in the Danbury area, we know you uh, first as Mayor Mark, uh, former mayor of Danbury. From that long position, uh, how near and dear to you is local government? Well, you know, look, uh, local government is where the rubber meets the road. Whatever, you know, comparison you want to make that's out there. And it just is the place where... Uh, you have to deliver services in an efficient manner. Uh, people are uh, right there with you. Uh, you know, it's not a macro approach to government. Mm-hmm. It's a micro approach. Um, so it's always near uh, and dear to my heart. I think, you know, mayor's offices and first selectman offices are really the, those are the bastions of innovation in government. I mean, you, mm-hmm. you, you have very much a limited amount of money. You've got limitless problems and you got to try to, how to make everything fit and work uh, to the best of your ability. So uh, I miss it. There's no mm-hmm. question about it, but it was time. 20 years is a long time. And then you elected yeah. position. And I just kind of felt like it was good for the community to make a change. It was good for me uh, mm-hmm. to make a change. So this has been an amazing experience what I'm doing now, but yeah. I can't say I, I don't miss uh, my last job. I do. I miss it, but um, I'm, I'm happy for the team that's in there and they're doing yeah. great job. When deciding to take a new uh, role with the state, what did you expect would help you from your time uh, in Danbury? Well, you know, I, I learned to be a very good administrator uh, in Danbury. And, you know, I, I was just thinking about that this morning. And um, what people have to understand is that while you would like to use business principles and governing, that's mm-hmm. good, right? Government is not a business. Yeah. We, don't, yeah. we, don't, we don't make a profit. We don't have to make a profit. We got to break even. Mm-hmm. Um, and business is not government, right? Those two intersections are uh, do happen from time to time, but generally speaking, the skills don't always translate back yeah. and forth. Sometimes they do. You know, we, mm-hmm. we get we get lucky with it with great governors and uh, elected officials, but you know, there's a learning curve there. So, um, moving from the mayor's office to a commissioner's office, uh, I was able to translate those skills of being an administrator in the mayor's mm-hmm. office to being an administrator in the state, and having served in the state legislature. I knew a little bit more about how the state mm-hmm. operates. I had run for governor, studied the state many times. So I got it. Our, and our processes are, they're huge and they're long and they're complicated and convoluted. Yeah. Um, that may be a challenge. I think it's always a challenge, I think, for anybody wanting to leave the state. But um, definitely I had the background experience to be able to do what I do. Now, man, I didn't know anything about, I mean, I didn't say anything. I knew about taxes. I'm a very mm-hmm. good numbers person, which is the weirdest thing because I was a terrible math student. Uh, but when I got to be mayor, I could, it just, I yeah. had an aptitude for it. I could tell you what's in every line item, how much is left, what's encumbered, what needs to be spent. It's just a weird thing. People would yeah. ask me, off the street, like, oh yeah, I think we got 42,003 cents in that account. Let me see what I can do. So um, that translates, but you know, our tax code, title 12 is very complicated. And so yeah. there is a, a, a steep learning curve and, and thank God for uh, the senior staff at DRS. They are outstanding. They've been there a long time. Um, they know their business. And they're not afraid to teach it. Yeah. And so uh, over the last two years, I've learned probably more than you want to know about our tax code <laughs> and how our tax system operates. Great. So it's been a kind of steep learning curve. But in those years, have there been moments where you kind of tapped into some of those old skills or pieces of knowledge from local leadership that kind of helped you navigate some some new territory? Oh, all the, all the time. All the time. Yeah. Look, our, our middle management and our, our staff, they, they can get uh, the front facing piece of what we do out to our taxpayers. They can get them to mm-hmm. fill out the documents and to report correctly and pay their, pay their liability. But, um, you know, being an administrator of 600 people is very similar to being a mayor of 714 employees. 
Um, we have the very similar problems. Also, we had to manage through COVID, which is I was doing as mayor, so it was the same yeah. kind of skill set there. Um, and HR function is, is very similar and was able to translate all of the uh, challenges and goods and wins and losses I've had in yeah. that arena uh, in governing. So um, no question about it. I was really well prepared for the position. Honored to be chosen by Governor, Governor Lamont, uh, who's just a terrific person to work for. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, every moment I can think of dozens of times where I would hire, I, I, did, I, I did do the old, well, when I was back at the let me tell you how we <laughs> handle this kind of thing. So I think it's been good. Of course, the majority of what we wanted to talk about with you today is the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. In your role as commissioner, you've been educating local leaders around the state about the importance of these federal funds. Before we go into this, some specifics, what is your elevator pitch for the IIJA? Right. So my job, uh, first of all, the governor appointed me as a senior advisor to the governor on infrastructure back in November once uh, the president had signed the IIJA bill. That's the bipartisan infrastructure law. Mm -hmm. um, and basically, the president had said, and he created an office of infrastructure in the White House, and he had said, look, um, we need a single point of entry in each state. You know, mm -hmm. we don't want to be going to four different agencies, and five different agencies. Um, we need somebody that's going to liaison with us. Uh, with the stakeholders in the community, with your governor, mm -hmm. uh, to be able to move the ball here because it is complicated and there are over 400 programs and, mm -hmm. and 19 different uh, federal agencies impact many of our state agencies. So, you know, governor said, you're the guy, you got to make this thing move and help me uh, disperse $6 billion over the next five years in infrastructure money. So, um, my pitch to our mayors uh, as I'm out there traveling the state and, and the benefit, again, here's the scale where I was president of CCM. I know a lot of the mayors in the state and first select mm -hmm. people who build those relationships. I leverage those and sat down with them. I've got a PowerPoint with the city councils or with them individually, the economic development people, their engineers, or city planners, and talk about where the opportunity is. And so mm -hmm. if I were to describe it at a, at a macro kind of pitch, I would say that, um, you know, ARPA, uh, which was in response to COVID, was mm -hmm. about getting relief, money, financial relief into people's hands right away, into the mayor's mm -hmm. hands, the governor's hands right away. Spend it. Yeah. And a lot of people thought that the bipartisan infrastructure law was the same way. It's mm -hmm. not. The bipartisan, bipartisan infrastructure law is about opportunity. It's about yeah. money's there, but you've got to put a program and plan together to be able to get it. That's a little tough for mayors and for selectmen because they're so busy every day on the day to day. Mm -hmm. I know I did that job. So yeah. where, where our team comes into place, and this is where the governor was very wise. Other states had just one person, one guy, one gal, whatever, and mm -hmm. no team beneath them. He gave me a mini budget to put together and hire up and staff up some people. Our team is there to help yeah. uh, cities and towns fill out these documents to, mm -hmm. to alert them to opportunities for them to point out where they probably can leverage some of the things that they're doing already and add in some federal money to it as well to get a mm -hmm. program or project done. So that's, I spent a lot of time doing that. And mm -hmm. also with nonprofits, uh, the tribes, um, as well as businesses. And I think okay. business is one area where we need to leverage a little bit more um, because they are uh, impacted uh, by mm -hmm. an inability to move goods and services around the state. So if we can make it easier for them to do their job They'll hire more people, they'll pay mm -hmm. more taxes, and our liability goes down. So we're working on that right now. But um, basically, uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law is broken into two pieces. Mm -hmm. One is money that went directly into existing programs. Okay. So let's say DOT got $100 million to uh, do a particular project. Uh, they now this year will get $140 million. So they get an extra about 38 40%. Okay. So that's what we call the plus up money. And that's mm -hmm. already programmed. It's already being spent. You see that out there, by the way, being deployed right now. If you okay. drive past a project with cones and uh, our team out there building something, that's uh, IJA money that's being put okay. to work. The exciting part is there's roughly uh, $550 billion in competitive grants for mm -hmm. cities and towns, for the states, for the counties, for the tribes. Um, and it's all about putting the best application together, telling the best story and a narrative. And going out and getting that money. So that's yeah. where we're really working hard. Uh, we just had our first round of uh, mm -hmm. what we call Safe Streets for All. That's a grant that's only for cities and towns. Mm -hmm. uh, billions of dollars in there. We had about 20 applications so far. And that's actually pretty good because 
remember that you know budgeting was done back in March. Folks yeah. know what to do. So we'll have even more next year as people get comfortable with the process. And we're going to see some grant awards in, in Connecticut uh, out of that program. So it's been exciting. Great. Um, so it's kind of interesting. You said, like ARPA was kind of for the immediate, we got to fix this right now kind of stuff. And the, the infrastructure stuff is looking to invest in the future, which kind of actually ties in this year with our convention theme. We're doing uh, getting back to the future of Connecticut because it feels like, you know, after three years where we, everyone's been kind of focused on COVID and like dealing with the emergencies and crisis as they come up. Now we're kind of looking at the infrastructure stuff like this and kind of thinking about future again and, and planning, moving us forward, you know, in things like uh, electric vehicle charging, clean hydrogen, energy efficiency are, are all tied in part of this. Um, why is it important and what should municipalities be thinking about in terms of the future? of infrastructure. Well, it's funny you mentioned that, right? Because people think of infrastructure and they go, oh, roads and bridges, blah, roads, blah, blah. Yeah. But it is so much more, than, uh, you know, and uh, the president and Congress have put in, for example, uh, Justice 40, which is the, the federal uh, equity uh, play in this mm -hmm. program, is in every single guidance that's dropped saying, hey, you got to consider underserved com communities. You got to consider communities that haven't been served before. So there's this uh, social uh, benefit here that we're working on. In addition to that, um, there are stuff that you never thought would be infrastructure, right? Yeah. I mean, who thought uh, electric vehicle charging stations are infrastructure? Who thought broadband um, right. delivering fast uh, internet to all four corners of the state is a uh, infrastructure play? But it is yeah. um, sustainable energy. And not, you know, you talk to any mayor out there, when we lose power in Connecticut, our residents really go through a difficult time. I used to just, yeah. internally I would chuckle, but I would be empathetic because I didn't have power either, right? If we had a big storm come through. So uh, usually the first day, it's a novelty. Yeah. Second day, it's a camp out. Third yeah, everybody day, takes all the frozen power. stuff out of the out and <laughs> cooks all the meat and yeah. Yep. yeah. Third day of no power, people are on the front lawn of City Hall with pitchforks and um, they want to chase you down and hang you uh, for not having power, even though you have nothing to do with it. Yeah. So having a grid, that can bounce back quickly from storms and having a power mm -hmm. grid that uh, will stay up and running during storms, hardening our grid, really important. There's yeah. billions of dollars in this program to do that. And it's gonna require a private public partnership between mm -hmm. us and the folks that own our grid, which is uh, Eversource. So um, it's all this stuff that people never thought about, protecting, saving Long Island Sound. Um, there's billions of dollars in there for uh, water recovery um, and uh, for, for um, sewer plants. Mm -hmm. um, so all this stuff that kind of goes in um, be, makes up this big ball of uh, infrastructure programs and projects that people just never thought. Of. And yeah. um, that's what makes exciting about me. Now, I have to tell you, I do sit through some webinars and some mm -hmm. live seminars about lack of water in Western U.S. Um, mm -hmm. And that's not our problem here. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, that's part of the job. But in general, um, I have to tell you, it's been, been pretty pretty incredible to see the breadth and scope of this program. It's, it's mm -hmm. $1.3 trillion for the United yeah. States of America over the next six years. That's pretty wild. You mentioned uh, broadband, which is, of course, a huge part of the infrastructure plan for in the future. Um, as we saw kind of during COVID, especially, there's a digital divide often between rural and urban communities, um, issues kind of like last mile coverage and stuff like that. How transformational can a state with comprehensive and affordable broadband be for its citizens? Oh, I think uh, it's um, changed dramatically, as we've seen during COVID, mm -hmm. the need for a stable uh, system. And it's become a, it's no longer um, sort of a cool thing to have. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it really is a um, utility, much like sewer, and much like water, right? So yeah. we have to think of broadband in that same way. That doesn't mean we can't let private industry play in that space and partner mm -hmm. with them, but it does mean that the government has to take a role in making sure that everybody has access to high-speed internet. Um, and yeah. we know that because some people, some people are still working from home. Um, mm -hmm. You know, now the new plan uh, here locally in Danbury is if we have a snow day, you're going to stay home and um, the kids are going to do the lessons on the computer so there's no more snow days yeah so you got to have internet to do that and you got to have internet that works um and you know a lot of what we face are particularly on the push on affordable housing is multiple dwelling units where if you have mm -hmm. 20 units and they're all dropping into one what we call node uh, when you while you yourself may have good internet at 1 p.m during the day mm -hmm. uh, at night at five o'clock everybody gets home it's drags it slows down yeah. because everybody's streaming everybody's uh you know, doing Zoom calls, whatever. 
So these are all of the challenges that go with this, mm -hmm. um, but it is critical for our economy. It's critical for our educational system and it's critical for the way we work to ensure yeah. that we have the system up and running. Now, Connecticut will most likely see a hybrid setup. And what I mean by that is we have areas that have very good coverage. And right mm -hmm. now what we're doing, what we're doing is mapping. Where do we have, in other words, to be able to serve an area we want to, we have to make mm -hmm. sure we don't have it, right? So we have, yeah. we have to know who has it, who doesn't. So we're mapping right now. And what you see is some areas are really well covered. Some areas have no coverage. Some areas, it just didn't make financial sense mm -hmm. for a company to, to run fiber optic. And fiber optic is the future. That's the gold yeah. standard of where we want to get to. Um, and I don't think we'll ever see every part of the state in fiber optic, mm -hmm. but we will see a blend of um, wireless uh Wi-Fi in some some rural areas. Mm -hmm. um, actually, some people along the uh, um, coast are using the Starlink from Elon Musk. Um, oh, interesting. Then, then you're going to see the uh, the traditional, um, you know, fiber optic on the pole into the mm -hmm. house and into the to the that last mile of delivery. So all that comes together. I see Connecticut as having a blended program, um, but all four all four corners of the state will have access to high speed internet with with a standard. Of, I hate, I hate to lay out a standard, yeah. but a standard that works efficiently, doesn't pixelate, mm -hmm. uh, allows the kids to do their homework and you to do a business call or, or, or respond to a doctor or anything like that. You are listening to the Municipal Voice on WNHH 103.5 FM. Are there other areas of the IIJA that, from your perspective, seem crucial to the future of state that, you know, haven't gotten as much press, maybe aren't as shiny and, and exciting to talk about as broadband or EV charging? Well, you know, being a former mayor, I'm, I'm big on wastewater treatment centers. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it, any mayor who, who runs one of those facilities or is mm -hmm. a partner in that facility, will, those facilities will tell you that it's a huge expense. And mm -hmm. every time there's a new regulation that comes out of the EPA, which is passed down to us, uh, requires a, almost a complete retooling of the plant. You know, Danbury mm -hmm. has a John Oliver Memorial sewer plant. <laughs> and uh, um, we just finished a retooling that we spent about mm -hmm. $80 million on. And that's to lower uh, phosphorus and to lower nitrogen content in okay. our output of our facility. Um, mm -hmm. Also, you're going to see that um, those standards, as they change, um, technology would change too. So you want to always add in uh, the newest technology. In Danbury, mm -hmm. um, one of the lessons I did was put a system in place that took our fats, oils, and grease, referred to as FOG, that okay. stuff that comes from restaurants, okay. and we now, turn, we now turn it into diesel fuel. Oh, that's cool. And we use that to fuel our fleet of bulldozers and trucks that work in mm -hmm. the public works department, as well as uh, sell some to uh, cities and towns around us. Oh, so, so it's actually an excess at this point from what you you need. You're yeah. generating more of it than you actually use. It. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's a, a program that uh, works and mm -hmm. it's been pretty cool. And those are the kinds of high tech stuff that that I like to see a little bit more funding in from the feds. Mm -hmm. There is money there right now, but uh, those rehabs and retrofits are important. Another area is lead pipes. Right, we've all heard the story of Flint, Michigan, uh, Jackson, Mississippi mm -hmm. is going through this right now, where uh, communities have uh, extraordinary amount of lead pipes, especially in New England, because we've been here so long. Yeah. Danbury, we have so many lead pipes. I wouldn't even, there some areas they weren't even mapped. Like I didn't know there was mm -hmm. a water in there because back in the 1930s and 40s and teens, when they put this stuff down, they didn't keep good records. So yeah, they didn't, didn't say what they made the pipe out of in 1930. Yeah, yeah. Well, where it even was? It's like, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's over there on Smith Street, right? Now everything is very well documented through GIS systems and stuff like mm -hmm. that. So um, you got to map where your lead pipes are, and then we run a replacement program as well. Um, yeah. There, We have about $450 million to do that statewide over the next mm -hmm. five years. It, we need about $4 billion to really mm -hmm. redo the whole state. But this will get the worst of the worst. This will get those mm -hmm. areas. And again, it's a mapping exercise. New London's yeah. done a phenomenal job. They'll get the first tranche of money because they've really done a great job at doing all their mapping. I've spent mm -hmm. a significant amount of money on it, millions of dollars. Yeah. So, um, I think you'll see uh, that area, which is not exciting, yeah. You know, but lead pipes critical for your health. You know, you don't want to be drinking water out of, out of yeah. lead pipes. So, um, those are the things that that are happening out there that you probably didn't know, um, but will really make a big difference in the quality of life. And incidentally, it's no secret that New London is number one in building permits uh, mm. as a city for new housing. Right. So, um, yeah. great, great city, uh, 
one of my favorites in Connecticut. Danbury is my favorite favorite, but I, I love of course. London, other ones as well. But um, definitely a lot of potential there. The this is going to be a very big partnership uh, at the state, you know, state local partnerships here. And you kind of already held some presentations for CCM, and you're going to be presenting again um, at the convention uh, November first. What do you imagine as ideal state regional municipal partnership? How would Mayor Mark approach this, and how would Commissioner Bouton approach this? Yeah, so um, well, as a mayor, I'd want to be heard, right? And I, I, my, I'd have a couple of concerns about the program. One is the guidance is very complicated that comes out of the federal government. Mm -hmm. So let me just put it this way. They, they issued a guidebook. This is a guidebook for the whole yeah. program. That's 440 pages. And then, yeah, so we all read it. And then each program that drops, uh, they have guidance for that. And that's usually mm -hmm. 120, 130 pages. So, so put it this way. The guidance for the guidance is 440 pages long. So yeah. no mayor, no first select, smaller the town, less resources they have, have the mm -hmm. time to sit there and even find out if they could qualify for these programs. So as mayor, I'd be frustrated with that. Yeah. The other piece that I'd be frustrated with, and that's we're working on this, is that um, I don't have the local match. You know, every federal program is an 80-20, 90-10. Mm -hmm. They're requiring uh, Danbury or Bethel or any Hartford to put up sometimes mm -hmm. millions and millions of dollars. I didn't budget for that. I don't have yeah. that. I'm not just sitting around. You know, we, at the, particularly at the municipal level, we operate on really fine line there are no big surpluses yeah and if they are you, you don't you don't get reelected. so every mayor keeps their you know and i get it i understand so um we're gonna need some help uh, in that area and, mm -hmm. and as mayor i would be concerned about that flipping it over as commissioner um i have some thoughts on how to help people with mm -hmm. that uh, um, uh, match i've got some stuff up my sleeve i think for next legislative session that i'm okay. hoping to, to build some support on i can't really say much about it right now uh, and then finally um, we're going to sit down with you and walk you through this, this guidance and try to help you yeah. fill out the full board. Um, we are using our council of governments uh, as one of those tools. They have mm -hmm. been fantastic and are led uh, by a great executive committee, and they have been on board. Mm -hmm. They've adopted our process. We meet with them regularly. Um, they do need resources. Mm -hmm. Other states have done that, have, have beefed up the grant writing capability. But you know, man, it's hard to find grant writers. I mean, yeah. that's not an easy job. And you have to tell a story. You got to write a narrative. So there, there's chat, there's things we got to work on. Um, I, I feel good. And then lastly, I'll just tell you, hiring mm -hmm. is a challenge as well. It's a, we have to staff up and scale up at the state. Some yeah. 200 new employees for DOT uh, to be able to do this thing over the next mm -hmm. six years. That's a lot of engineers. Yeah. Uh, Deep needs staff. DPH needs staff. And all these private engineering firms and construction mm -hmm. firms, they need workers and staff, mm -hmm. uh, as well as just folks out there in the construction industry. Everybody uh, is going to need uh, to scale up. And that it's hard right now. It's hard finding yeah. help. And mayors will tell you that. I mean, they're pulling their hair yeah. out trying to find people to drive to plow trucks and, plow trucks mm -hmm. and things like that. It's yeah. interesting because those jobs, people used to die to get those. Clamor for, yeah, get, I would have a good government job. People yeah. out the door all the time wanting to work it. Parks and Rec, or work at the public works. Not so those much government benefits, not not as much these days. Yeah. Um, and that, that's interesting. I know you, you've been talking about this issue with, with finding the people. And uh, there are some other organizations even joined in with you and calling on Congress to help the state with this problem. Without the people, we can't do the projects. Yeah, so we've been working. And remember, so this, pro you know, this program is a nationwide program. Mm -hmm. Every state is looking for engineers. Every state is looking for um, uh, uh, scientists and environmental people. Yeah. You know? So we're all competing. Now you're there and you're a graduate. I, I talked to a kid, I was on a plane a couple of weeks ago and I talked to a kid from West Virginia who's starting his uh, last year and he's a, he's a civil engineer. I yeah. gave him my card. I said, when you're done, I'm going to hire you. We're going to hire you over at DOT. Yeah. Um, so come on up here and grab four of your friends while you're at it. Um, but uh, there are states that can hire very quickly. Um, mm -hmm. Texas comes to mind, some of the other ones. Um, there are states that are adding bonuses or all kinds of signing things to people to get them to come to work for them because they know yeah. and they recognize it's going to be a challenge. We're doing similar kind of stuff in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. uh, we're just getting all that uh, wired up right now, but it's tough competing yeah. out there uh, in the marketplace for these folks. So if you're young and you're thinking, geez, what am I going to do with my life? Go be a civil engineer. You will write your own ticket.
Yeah, the, the the Infrastructure Act is is making the infrastructure a boom in business right now. There's jobs to be for had years. for and years to come. Years. Yeah, because yeah, and because these are long term projects that are going to be continuing That's to right. go on for a long time. That's a good thing for kids to keep in mind if they're trying to sign on a career right now. So one question we like to ask all of our guests is: Are you feeling optimistic about the future of Connecticut um, with all these funds, extra funds coming through from ARPA and IIJ? Does Connecticut have what it takes to invest in our future at the local and state level? You know, I, I am. I'm, I've always been bullish on Connecticut because of the bones that we have, the great bones. Um, yeah. And I think that, uh, you know, we are uniquely positioned for success here. Um, I like the last two years on my, on my tax side. I like the revenue mm -hmm. numbers. I like, I like where we are. Uh, in terms of our fiscal security, which is a big deal, paying down our pensions. I know it's mm -hmm. boring. People are like, ah, oh, but it's a big deal. And I'm just going to yeah. say, for the record, totally off topic here, but the new pension system that was mm -hmm. put in several years ago ain't like the old pension system. Everybody's like, oh, I know why you went to the state. You're going to get this big pension. No, I'm not. I'm what's called yeah. tier four. It's going to take 10 years. I don't know if I'll be there for 10 years. Um, so the chances of me getting a pension from the state are slim. It, it's basically a defined contribution. Plan. So yeah. um, what I'm saying is that we even made the tough choices as much as you negativity you hear about this stuff mm -hmm. in uh, getting our costs under control. Yeah. And uh, as you go out in the out years, you'll see that the cost curve has bent dramatically because mm -hmm. of that you see a drop in what we're going to yeah. But paying that down now will allow us to borrow billions in the future at a much lower rate for our, for our children and our grandchildren. So that's been something that's not sexy. You don't see it out there. People don't know about it, but it's yeah. really, really important. And I watch that stuff because I that's my business. Yeah. So uh, that's what makes me feel good about where we are. Mm -hmm. I do worry about energy costs. I think we've got work to do there, but I think yeah. the governor and I, we talk about a lot. He is committed. Uh, part of that is building out a stronger, more resilient grid. And that's what we're going to use the mm -hmm. intermodal for. So DEEP is all over that and, and uh, working hard on those things. So there are, we do have challenges, not gonna say we don't. Yeah. Uh, labor shortage is another one. Office of Workforce Strategies is working on that. Um, and we, we are now bringing in our building and trades uh, folks, as well as our Votech schools, mm -hmm. um, as well as our community colleges to align everybody so that we can turn out these folks. And, and the big thing that the building and trades, again, this is not the most exciting thing in the world is they are working on pre-apprentice programs. And I was like, mm -hmm. what's, what's pre-apprentice? Are you, you have apprentice. Why would you need a pre-apprentice? Yeah. Well, pre-apprentice gives people uh, a taste of a particular career field before they mm -hmm. fully commit to an apprenticeship program, mm -hmm. which is great. So, you know, I, I bring up the carpentry machine. They've got a beautiful facility where you can learn. You know, you can try it. See if you like yeah. it. And if you like doing that kind of work, um, they'll roll you right into the apprenticeship program, which gives you about two years of full training. And by the way, in an apprenticeship program, you got textbooks. You got to read this mm -hmm. stuff. Right? It's not just a you know goof where you've got to go get coffee every day. Yeah. Um, and eventually um, you become a fully uh, licensed um, uh, union uh, carpenter and mm -hmm. you make more money and you'll be in demand. So um, I, I feel hopeful uh, mm -hmm. about that stuff. And I feel hopeful about the systems that we're starting to put in place to turn out workers to meet the 21st century. You know, I couldn't end or, or finish up without giving a plug for, for what Danbury is doing. They're creating a mm -hmm. career cloud. Um, and this career academy will take 1,500 students, grades 6 through 12, okay. and they will choose a career area that they're interested in. So maybe they're mm -hmm. interested in medicine. Maybe they're interested in avionics. Maybe they're interested in business. Maybe they're interested in marketing. Maybe they're interested in um, pharmaceuticals. And you're, you will track that career through your curriculum all the way up until graduation. Mm -hmm. um, so you'll be prepared. You'll be what's called ready to work, meaning that you understand that you got to be on time. you got to Hi, you get dressed yeah. appropriately, whatever. Um, and um, you'll be prepared for if you require further education or maybe you just require a, you know, one year degree or two year degree. So it's pretty exciting what they're yeah. doing with this. And they're leveraging local businesses, places like Danbury Hospital, Danbury Airport, mm -hmm. you know, the, the businesses that are around the airport um, to all be uh, uh, partners in this program to turn out kids that are ready that they can employ later yeah. on. It's great. It's visionary. And uh, I applaud them. And there's other programs springing up around the state like that. Mm -hmm. And that's what we got to do. It doesn't mean you're not going to go to college. Uh, you know, yeah. in our both tech schools, 
Henrietta Tech and Danbury, 80% of the kids there go to college. Yeah. So you, you finish with a you know, degree, uh, whatever your area of study was, you still go on to a four-year degree. So mm-hmm. good for you. Well, it sounds like the future is pretty bright then. Like, you know, the good programs are going on all over Connecticut. It is. We, you know, we, we definitely are positioned here in Connecticut. Um, I, I, I would also, I'm just going to say, again, a little off topic, but cutting taxes, and, and I'm a fiscal conservative, was the way to go this year. We, we cut taxes by almost $700 million in a variety of areas. And, and these cuts were, by the governor, were smart. They were mm-hmm. judicious. And what happens is, is that they will, pay dividends in the future because we won't have to roll back the tax cuts. You know, you can yeah. go too far on that. And then you got to go back to the residents and you got to ask for more. Mm-hmm. Like, well, yeah, you know, I just gave it the, you know, now they got to give you more. And what happens is they lose faith in government. So um, it's, it's, it's important to be deliberative in that process. Right? Mm-hmm. Don't go overboard because we know there are some headwinds in the next three to four years with the economy. We got to be yeah. prepared. We've got to have a savings account to cover that. So I like where we are. I'm optimistic about our state. It's a great state, and uh, this beautiful fall day, it's wonderful to be here. You're here. Well, Commissioner Bouton, thank you so much for speaking with us today. We really appreciate it. It's great to be here. Fan of CCM. Love it. You guys are awesome. And again, if uh, you don't know about CCM, if you're just listening to this for the first time, go to uh, their website. Tons of information. And there's programs that even you know us regular people can uh, go and listen to. So That's right. as a past president. Uh, Thank you to the staff at CCM. You guys are awesome. We appreciate all you do. We'd like to thank our guest, Mark Boughton. I'd like to thank our sponsors, Gateway Community College and Housatonic Community College. Learn more at gatewayct.edu and housatonic.edu. The Municipal Voice is a co-production by CCM and WNHH 103.5 FM. Kevin Maloney is our executive producer. Christopher Gilson is our producer. Harry Draws is on the boards. And I'm Matt Ford, your host. Be sure to check out our Facebook page and give us a like. And watch out for our CCM chat series on our YouTube page. CCM's annual convention returns Tuesday, November 1st at the Mohegan Sun Convention Center. This year's convention will be capped off by Connecticut's final 2022 gubernatorial debate. Learn more at ccm-ct.org.